Hello again. Uh, in the previous session, we discussed uh, descriptive statistics, the numerical uh, uh, measures of descriptive statistics. Uh, we discussed the measures of uh, central tendency and the measures of uh, dispersion or variability. Uh, in this session, we will start uh, uh, another type of descriptive statistics, which is the graphical uh, descriptive statistics. Uh, uh, in this session, we will talk about some graphs that can summarize uh, a massive amount of data, and we will see the benefits of uh, looking at some displays that a lot of people can understand and you can share the information uh, with in many in many aspects. So let's go to the slide and see uh, uh, what we will discuss today. As I just said in the previous session, we described a normal data set uh, using two types of measures. The measures of central tendency uh, the mean, the mode, and the median, and the measures of variability or dispersion, uh, such as the range, the standard deviation, and variance. And we said that these measures are common measures that are used in almost all uh, descriptive statistics. Uh, we're moving now into graphical displays of data. And the objectives would be to first compare between raw data and processed data, then looking at a histogram or a frequency distribution and see what it means, then how to construct a histogram or a frequency distribution, and then uh, what's a relative frequency distribution, uh, what is a cumulative frequency distribution, and we will end up talking about using Excel for constructing frequency distributions. This may actually take two or three small sessions uh, to be able to cover all of these uh, uh, questions or issues. So let us go ahead and start with the first one. What are raw data and the processed data? Well, in general, uh, raw data are the data recorded in the sequence in which they are collected without any effort uh, to organize. Uh, to sort, to manipulate, or analyze. So the numbers as is, as we see it in any spreadsheet, or as we type it, or as we acquire it. Uh, any one of these four actions, organizations, sorting, uh, manipulation, or analysis, would turn the data from raw data to what we call processed data. These are data that has meaning. Let's take uh, a very, uh, uh, an example on students' grades, which is an example that all students are familiar with, and see what do we mean by raw data and processed data. If one look at this set of uh, numbers here, uh, these represent raw data, raw grade data. Uh, the numbers are scattered, they are all over the place. Uh, we have columns here that we do not even know if these represent different uh, exams or tests or all of this data set represent one exam, uh, they are numbers as is. Uh, no organizations, no sorting, uh, no manipulation. Uh, what benefits can we get out of this set of data? Well, we really cannot get much out of it because we need to know more to be able to convert this raw, raw data into a processed or useful or meaningful data. Let's now see if we add some identity to the data. As you can see here, the first column represents the student's ID. And now the four columns that we've seen in the first slide are identified by exams. So the first column represents exam one, the second exam two, exam three, and the exam four. So now we're taking the first step to convert raw data into processed data. We have students' ID, so we know that every row means something. And we have columns representing different exams, so we know that every column uh, represents uh, a single or one exam. Very good. 
obviously the data now makes a better sense than the first data set that we looked at. What can we do with this data? Well, from a student's viewpoint, each student may be looking at his or her ID and looking at the different uh, scores or the different grades in the different tests. A student that knows a little bit of descriptive statistics may decide to calculate the mean value, uh, the range, uh, and the standard deviation if he or she wishes to do so. And by doing that, they are really looking at the center uh, of their grade score and the variability. Uh, for example, if we look at these two students here, uh, we can see that these are A students, 90.4 and 90.7. Uh, if these students are looking at their grades, I'm sure they will feel good about it. Uh, they also can look at the range. I mean, the first student has a range of 15.9. The first one has a range of 12.4, meaning that the second one here uh, is a bit more consistent in his or her grades than the first one. And hopefully each one of them will determine their uh, grade standard deviation and Keep it in mind as they compare their performance in this class and the other classes. Let's now look at other students. Let, let's look at this student here. We see that this student is a low C. He's got 70.8. Uh, you look at his range is 22.8. That's a wide range. He has a standard deviation of 10.7. And you can see that this student uh, has almost failed uh, the class in two tests, and he tried to recover in one by making a B in one and the C on the other, and that's what got him or got her this average grade. Uh, we may also look at the students like this one here, where the range is 39.3. That's a huge range. When you have a range of 40 points in four exams, uh, that's quite concerning. And you can see that this students can, can do a great job, 98.7 in one exam, but boy, he can turn around and they fail the next test and then try to recover, as you can see, by making C's when it's really too late. And here is a student that can or was able to make an A all the way, or at least an, a B average, has ended up making a C. So uh, I hope that every student looking at this data, when they next look at their exams and look at their exam grades, they will see it the same way that we see it here. Uh, it's not just the average, it's also the consistency of the grades. It's one thing that students will make uh, a certain uh, grade uh, or score in one test, and it's another to keep that consistent from one test to another. How about a teacher? Well, from a teacher viewpoint, uh, we need to uh, look at uh, how teachers would look at their data or grade scores. And what we see here is a teacher may, be, may decide to calculate the mean and the range and the standard deviation for each student, and may actually decide to sort the data uh, from the highest or the largest value to the lowest or the other way around, so that they can divide students uh, by, grade, by grade letters. If we can see here uh, data in a descending order, starting with the highest uh, grade average going to the lowest uh, grade average and the teacher by doing so can divide the students into different grade letters a b c and so on so that is one way uh, to convert the, the 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 ones was a raw data into a processed data or meaningful data that both the student and the teacher uh, can make use of uh, in addition to that, a teacher may decide, uh, and assuming that he's collecting this data on a regular basis, he may decide to look at many exams and many tests and kind of develop a graph that give him a good idea about his performance or his, or his class performance. Uh, when we go to uh, Excel, we find that we can actually uh, develop a nice graph given the letter grades and the number of students that have obtained these grades. 
in the previous example, we have two students that made an A minus, nine that made a B minus, six that made a C plus, seven that made a C, and one that made a C minus. We can use this data uh, corresponding to the grade letters, and we can simply go to block this data first, or block the two columns, then we can go to insert, and we can select any one of these graphs. We can select the columns, line, uh, pie chart, bar chart. Let's say that we're going to select column, and when you click on that, you will immediately get a graph, what we call a bar chart of the student's grades. And you can see in this graph here that we have the different students' grades, the grade letters, and the corresponding number of students who obtained these grades. This is a quick display of the class performance that a teacher can use uh, for their own sake to look at the class performance or to share it with other uh, teachers or with their deans uh, or head of departments uh, so that they can uh, uh, sort of describe the performance in the class and perhaps make some sense out of that. Uh, for example, why there is a gap between the A minus and the B minus, uh, why in this class we don't have students fail in the class. Uh, uh, you know, you can, you can make uh, so many uh, points by just looking at a bar chart. Now, a bar chart, I would not describe it as a statistical tool, but I definitely can describe it as a data uh, description tool. One way to describe data is to use a bar chart. Uh, it's very simple, and you can see a bar chart uh, displayed in many uh, situations, and they can be really meaningful. Let's look at the slide and see some examples. These are the net worth of the top five richest American people by the Forbes magazine in 2009. And what we see here in the horizontal axis are the names of the uh, billionaires, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Lawrence Ellison, Christy Walton, and Jim Walton. And you can see the vertical axis here representing their net worth. And you can see that the least here is about $20 billion, and the highest is close to 50, 50 something billion dollars. So that's a bar chart that can be very meaningful, and by just looking at it, then no one needs to look at the individual observations or the detailed data. You can do that for these five people, or you can do it for 50 people, and the display will cer certainly serve the purpose of it, which is a simple display of important information. We can even uh, display their ages, which may be interesting to some. And uh, these pictures are replacing the bars in the part chart. So you can see the height of the picture is actually the age of each one of these of multi-billionaires. And uh, by looking at a graph like that, you can compare uh, ages of these multi-billionaires and perhaps you can make some sense out of that. So this is one type of graph that we can uh, do in Excel uh, in a few seconds. Uh, the next type of graph is what I call a statistical graph, is the histogram. And that we will discuss uh, uh, very shortly. But to give you a quick idea, I can take the billionaire data, and then instead of looking at uh, their uh, net worth by names, which is a bar chart, or ages, uh, and uh, represent these in bar charts, I can actually look at more data uh, of the net worth of uh, uh, billionaires and kind of categorize it or classify it and convert it into uh, a nice graph like this one, which is a histogram. And the histogram will be the subject of our, of our next session. The point to make here is that in essence, a histogram is a bar chart. As you can see here, we have bars all over the place. However, it's a bar chart that reflects always a frequency. The number of people or the number of students or the number of situations or events. So it is a bar chart that always reflect frequencies. And 
it's also a reflection of classes as you can see you can see that all these bars have the same width or the same size uh, that's the width size so in essence a histogram is a bar chart uh, which reflects the frequencies of equally spaced uh, classes of values of the variable in this case the the dollar value of the billionaires uh, uh, values of the variable under study a bar chart on the other hand may take a different uh, uh, forms with vertical axes may be representing frequencies like the histogram or other uh, uh, variables or other measures so a bar chart can or may take different forms with vertical axes representing frequency perhaps or other parameters both histograms and bar charts can be used for qualitative and quantitative variables however most of the time histograms are used for quantitative variables a bar chart on the other hand can be used with arrangement that can be either uh, mutually exclusive or non uh, mutually exclusive like in this case what uh, Bill Gates net worth will uh, will not prohibit Warren Buffett uh, for making the same amount of money or even more so you can see here that there are differences uh, between a bar chart and the histogram uh, in the next session we will be talking about uh, the uh, 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 histogram and we will discuss how to construct a histogram first manually and then using Excel uh, uh, spreadsheet. It's really important that we understand the underlying concepts of constructing histogram. Uh, one of the reasons for that is that histograms are often used to display uh, uh, information everywhere. And if you don't understand the underlying concepts of a histogram, you can easily be deceived by a histogram. Uh, people uh, can use statistics in many ways uh, not to lie but not to tell the whole truth uh, by covering up things and displaying and emphasizing uh, things that they want you uh, to know in graphs so we need to understand the underlying concepts of a histogram or a frequency distribution uh, and then we will see how easy it is to do it later on uh, using uh, Microsoft Excel, uh, but hopefully you will understand the basis and the underlying concepts before we go to Excel. So uh, we will discuss that in the next session.